Welcome to Dogelog Index 5. This is a series where I share the business and development process of taking a project I started as a joke and turning it into a billion dollar unicorn company that is going to the moon. The last 39 days have been a grind, but I'm happy to announce the new design for Doge House is live. This took way longer than expected to get out there. One, I've just been distracted with crypto, VC, accelerators, all this business junk. And then from the coding point of view, we did a lot more than just changing out the design. We also changed entire React frameworks. We refactored the entire data later, data day, data layer to use React query. And then also we just made a lot of bad decisions along the way that we had to refactor as we were refactoring. Honestly, I'm pretty burnt out of doing total rewrites from scratch. As a developer who only cares about their craftsmanship, I love doing rewrites because it gives me the chance of taking the crappy code I wrote two weeks ago and putting out a more elegant design and just having beautiful code. But the entire project just gets put on hold while you re-implement everything you had in just a slightly different way. And it feels awful because you're kind of just churning your wheels and making no real progress, but the internal code is nicer. But the thing is, two weeks go by and your new elegant design isn't even that great again because you forgot this one use case that kind of like bogs everything down again. Don't get me wrong, I think the changes we made were good and they're going to help the long-term development health of the project, but I tend to over-refactor as a developer because I just want to clean everything up and it does feel like I tried to refactor too many things at once here. Anyway, let's talk about some mistakes that were made and the first one has to do with Flexbox. You know, that CSS thing that's great for positioning elements? Well, we thought it was so great that we would apply Flexbox globally. You don't actually want to apply Flex to literally every HTML element, so we use the not operator to ignore things like scripts and head tags. This worked great for a little while, until one day I added a third party component because I was just too lazy to implement my own date time picker. Well, the rest of the world doesn't expect Flex to be the default. So when you apply flex to every element of that third party component, it absolutely just butchers it. No biggie though, we'll just take the CSS classes that that third party component uses and we'll ignore them by sticking them in our not operator and then flex just won't be applied to them. This worked great, but it had a little bit of a side effect. For whatever reason, this increased the priority of that selector. We're using Tailwind CSS and there's some places that we just don't want flex. So what we did is we add the inline block class or the hidden class to some elements. But now all of a sudden those all got overridden by our global flex selector thing. Again, not a big deal. We'll just take all the Tailwind CSS classes and we'll stick them in the not operator so they're ignored and flex is not applied to them. And you can kind of see where this is going, but this is not the straw that broke the camel's back. Apparently the not operator or how I was using it is not supported in some browsers. I checked the documentation beforehand. It was green for all the browsers, so I thought I was good, but apparently Opera Gaming Edition doesn't like to behave like a regular browser. Now you're probably like, Ben, who cares about Opera Gaming? Just give it the middle finger, move on with your life. And you know, I'm right there with you, bud. But the thing is, Firefox Gecko didn't work either. Like what? At this point, I've just had enough with this stupid flex global CSS selector thing and I just scrapped it. I'm sure there's probably something clever I could have done to get to work in all these different places, but I just could care less at this point. So I wrote a couple regular expressions to literally plaster the class name flex all over every single element in the entire project. And I ripped out that global selector and now we just live a happy life. Mistake number two introduced a pretty nasty bug. See, Doge House received a pull request to add Discord OAuth as another way to log in. I reviewed the code, it looked good. They followed the same format as our Twitter and GitHub OAuth. I pulled down the code locally, I tested it, it functioned properly, and so I did what any dev would do and I pushed it to prod. Now there's something you should know about our authentication system. If you log in with a GitHub account that uses the email bob at bob.com, and then later you log in with a Twitter account that uses the email bob at bob.com, they will map to the same Doge House account. The rationale for this is sometimes a person will just accidentally press a different auth provider, but they're actually the same person. GitHub and Twitter confirm you own that email, but apparently Discord does not. I can literally go and sign up with any email on Discord if it's not already taken, do Discord OAuth, 
and it will send that platform this unverified email. So this can be used to hijack accounts. For example, let's say I'm Sally. I go to Discord and I create a new account using the email bob at bob.com. Then I go on Doge House, I OAuth the Discord, and I'm now logged in as Bob's Doge House account. As far as I'm aware, no one used this maliciously on Doge House, and within 24 hours of it being pushed out, it was taken down and also just in case I just reset everyone's auth tokens. One way to fix this is to check when Discord sends you an email if they also tell you whether it's been verified or not and only trust it if it's been verified. But like, why is Discord even sending unverified emails in the first place? Like it's literally the most useless piece of information in the world. I'm not gonna be doing that though. I'm just gonna be scrapping the entire matching process for emails because at the end of the day, we're having to trust a third party company. And at any time, the entire integrity of Doge House can come crumbling down if they have a bug and how the email is being sent over. Meanwhile, the business team here at Doge House has been doing a lot of high level strategy thinking because it's becoming more and more apparent as each day goes by that building a drop-in audio platform is a losing proposition. Discord is introducing a discovery mechanism for stages, and if it's anything like their discovery for servers where it's buried at the bottom and the choices are very limited, I'm not too worried about it. But at the same time, I just never thought they were ever gonna do this for stages. Twitter is on the verge of releasing their drop-in audio feature called Spaces, and pretty much every company is adding drop-in audio in one form or another. So what the business team has been thinking about is what exactly is Doge House going to do to differentiate itself to not just get gobbled up by these massive drop-in audio platforms that are just like appearing out of nowhere. And we think the answer is to change the marketing. We don't actually know what the new slogan is going to be, we just know drop in audio for creators is not it. And also along the way, we've kind of stumbled upon the problem that we're gonna solve. We did this completely backwards. Every startup guru will tell you start with a problem and then mold your solution around that. We started with a product that we thought would just be cool to build. Drop in audio rooms, live chat, recordings, clips, subscribe to creators, and algorithmic audio feed that would just be a straight banger of a platform, right? But in thinking a lot about this, we found a gnarly problem, and that's discovery for audio content just sucks. There's a lot of places where you can host a podcast and find new podcasts, but they all boil down to the pretty much the same thing. You pick a category, say business, you see the top 25 business podcasts, and you just pick one of those to listen to. There's great tools out there that'll help you create a podcast. But if you don't have an already existing audience, you can't just grow your podcast by putting your episodes on Apple or Google Podcasts. No one listens to them. You have to go to other social media and then grow that way. Contrast this with the video world where I can go on YouTube or TikTok, start posting there and build an entire audience because they actually have a good discovery system. And I don't see why you can't apply the same thing to audio. And I've been saying audio content because I see this not just including podcasts, but also drop in audio rooms and short form audio clips. I kind of want to experiment with a feed that's entirely just short audio sound bites, whether it be 30 second funny bits or maybe clips taken from a longer podcast. And then those are used as gateway drugs into longer form podcast episodes. And I already know this works because Joe Rogan right now is just absolutely killing it on YouTube where he breaks up his podcast into little bits. You see when we change the messaging, all of a sudden Doge House is in like this totally different category from Discord and Twitter spaces. And that's how we see Doge House winning. Now we just need to take that messaging and piece it into a cohesive pitch deck because believe it or not, we, we don't have a pitch deck yet, what? <laughs> anyway, that's it for this Doge log. I haven't heard anything back from Y Combinator yet. I wouldn't be surprised if we get rejected though. In retrospect, our application is pretty weak sauce, but at the same time, I'm wondering if I even wanna do an accelerator. It feels like school and I kinda just wanna be homeschooled.